Hi everyone, this is my video on the top 5 myths or misconceptions of the Great Sphinx of Giza that the internet will not let die. These myths may keep existing due to lack of information, ignorance, or just plain old stubbornness, but hopefully we will come out a little bit better on the other side. So, counting down. Alright. Number five, the Egyptian government refuses to let people do sonar scans on the Sphinx. This is definitely not true. Different scientific teams have done sonar scans on the Sphinx to see if there are additional rooms or tunnels inside of it. However, historically there have been difficulties analyzing these results. As Dr. Mark Lehner, foremost expert on the Giza Plateau monuments, explained in a PBS Q&A, quote, The remote sensing of the Sphinx and the Sphinx Temple produced three anomalies that they thought significant enough to drill, and then to probe with a micro-optics downhole miniature camera. Even the most promising anomaly in the southeast corner of the Sphinx turned out to only be natural cavities and irregularities in the rock, end quote. So, with all of that information, we are going to dub this misconception about the Sphinx blatantly false. On to number four. There are secret tunnels in the Sphinx. Archaeologists have explored quite extensively the different tunnels in and around the Sphinx. They'd largely go nowhere, and they were most likely dug by treasure hunters, though it has been hypothesized that at least one may have been an unfinished tomb. The hole in the top of its head, which people tend to speculate about the most, was originally just damage that people decided to dig deeper into to see if there was hidden something hidden inside of it. That's why you can see old-timey illustrations of people standing inside of it. It was about six feet deep when it was unrepaired in the 1920s, Berets did some slapdash repairs to the Sphinx using cement and filled in the hole. Since then, it's been cleared out and replaced with the little door that you can see on it today. This is all very well documented and nothing mysterious about it. Alright, number three, that there are secret chambers under the paws of the Sphinx. A lot of these rumors started when Edgar Sace, a psychic, had several psychic readings about the Hall of Records and the Sphinx. Uh, Graham Hancock, a pseudoscientific journalist, made accusations that the Egyptian government wouldn't allow for any scans or searches of the tunnels either, which, as I've already explained, isn't true. Uh, increased speculation about hidden chambers blossomed as scans of the Sphinx and its enclosure indicated anomalies underneath the Sphinx, which some people interpreted as chambers. Here's a recap of those scans. Uh, this, again, is from that PBS Q&A by Dr. Lehner and Zahi Hawass. I'll try to go through this quick. Uh, Florida State University carried out a remote sensing survey around the Sphinx in April 1996. They claimed to have found rooms and tunnels in front of the Sphinx and running from the rear of the Sphinx. Several other projects made similar claims. SRI International did an electrical resistivity and acoustical survey in 1977 and 78. In 1987, a Japanese team from Wasade uh, University in Tokyo carried out an electromagnetic sur sounding survey on the Khufu Pyramid and Sphinx. Uh, they reported evidence of a tunnel oriented north-south under the Sphinx, a water pocket uh, two and a half to three meters below surface near the south hind paw, and another cavity near the north hind paw. In 1991, a team consisting of geologist Robert Schock from Boston U and Thomas Dobecki and John Anthony West carried out a survey on the Sphinx using seismic refraction, refraction tomography, and seismic reflection. Uh, the investigators interpreted their data to indicate a shallower subsurface 
surface weathering patterns toward the back and deeper weathering toward the front. Uh, they in took that to indicate that the back of the Sphinx and its ditch were carved by Khafre later than the front, uh, and interpreted their data to likewise indicate subsurface cavities in the front of the left paw and from the left paw back along the south flank. In 1992... Uh, the Egyptian National Research Institute of Astronomy and Geophysics carried out a study of the ground below the Sphinx using uh, shallow seismic refraction. They, however, reported no evidence of cavities. Now, in 2009, Lanner and Hawass did drilling under the Sphinx to relieve the rising water table that threatens the monument. No chambers were found. This drilling put to rest, or at least should have, the idea of chambers beneath the Sphinx. When Lanner and Hawass drilled, they even included the area under the left paw of the Sphinx, which, of all the areas the seismic surveys revealed anomalies, that's where conspiracy theorists tended to interpret that there was a chamber. Uh, the anomaly was detected 7 meters below the paw, and they drilled as deep as 10 meters, and still discovered nothing. However, the conspiracy theory still persists. Despite the existence or persistence of the conspiracy theory, uh, we are going to rule this one blatantly false as well. Alright, now myth number two. The Sphinx's head was recarved. What was the head before it was a human? Depends on who you talk to. Maybe it was a lion. Maybe it was a jackal. Doesn't really matter. There's just straight up no evidence for this. It's based purely on speculation because of two main factors, really. One, the Sphinx's head looks too small for the body, and also because the head isn't as worn as the rest of the body. The weathering part is easy and objectively explained. The Sphinx is made up of three different kinds of stone of differing densities, known as member 1, member 2, and member 3. Member 1 is this hard, brittle shoal reef that the Sphinx is on that dates back to when Egypt was still under the sea. It rises up to the lower levels of the Sphinx's paws and rump. Member 2, which is what most of the Sphinx's body is built out of, is seven layers of alternating harder and softer limestone that has suffered greatly at the hands of sand, wind, and a weathering process known as haloclasty, which is when moisture gets into the limestone, crystallizes, and then causes the stone to flake off when the wind blows. Uh, the head and neck is made of member 3 limestone, which is softer at the neck and harder at the head. Uh, this is good for building, which is why many of the surrounding structures are built from this layer of stone. And it's also good for carving details into the face, because it's more durable. That's why the face isn't as weathered as the body, and why the base and body of the Sphinx has had to undergo such extensive restoration over time. Now, theories about why the head looks too small that don't involve recarving are based on a little more speculation. But keep in mind, theories that it was recarved have even less evidence to support it. First off, it looks much smaller than it would have originally. It's missing its nose, the back part of its nemes headdress, the sides of its headdress, and likely a beard. Also, Dr. Lehner has hypothesized that an unexpected problem with the monumental sculpture caused the builders to extend the body. If they had adhered to what we traditionally consider the quote-unquote standard proportions of a sphinx, a fissure in the bedrock would have run right through the rump of the sphinx, threatening the structural integrity of the monument. Theoretically, they may have needed to extend the body out for additional stability. Uh, at that point, the head was likely already carved or being carved, so making the head larger wouldn't have been an option. So, 
Considering there's no evidence to support a recarving of the Sphinx head, and the only circumstantial evidence supporting it can be explained by geology, we're going to give this one a simple no evidence, because you don't want to completely close the door on something. Alright, we saved the best for last. Number one, the Sphinx is 10 to 12,000 years old. This one is largely based on the water erosion hypothesis promoted by Dr. Robert Schock. This theory is treated like gospel by its proponents, but it's definitely not. Honestly, I'm not going to try and change your minds on it here. I'm just going to present the basic controversy, though obviously you'll be able to tell by my tone that I think the theory is largely nonsense. The water erosion hypothesis states that the damage done to the Sphinx was largely caused by flooding and rain that only could have occurred in quantities and over a time period dating back to about 8,000 to 10,000 BCE. Basically, every aspect of the water erosion hypothesis has been contested by one or more prominent geologists. There's not a single geologist who actually agrees with him. I'll post links to all of the relevant academic articles and information below. Also, if there's any geologists out there that feel I'm doing a poor job explaining this, feel free to message me. I'm doing my best to explain their arguments in a very limited time frame. The undulating weathering on the Sphinx, along with the severe degradation that Shock attributed to thousands of years of rain and flooding, has been explained by Dr. K. Lal Gowry, who, along with Dr. Tom Egner, are the two geologists who have worked most extensively on the Sphinx. This weathering is a combination of haloclasty and wind erosion. The weathering rates differ depending on the varying porosity of limestone, creating the undulating effect that caught Shock's eye. Obviously, rainwater and flash floods do contribute to a certain extent, but that is not the primary source of weathering. This is the most widely accepted explanation among geologists. Shock, of course, disagrees with this, and is still sticking to his guns and insists that it looks more like water erosion than wind erosion. As an example, he points to a nearby limestone temple with wind erosion that has much more jagged lines than the rounded ones on the Sphinx. When it was noted to him that the temple's limestone was not from the same strata as the Sphinx limestone, and therefore wouldn't weather the same way, uh, he didn't seem to care, and insists that they are comparable. Schock also insists that the vertical erosion on the walls of the Sphinx could only have been caused by thousands of years of rainwater. Uh, Jorn Christensen, a geoscientist with 20 plus years of experience in the private sector, was curious about this and inspected it himself and determined that the vertical erosion easily could have occurred before the Sphinx was even carved. Uh, this was caused by water leaking through fissures in the ground and leaking down dissolving the limestone. Christensen also shares most geologists' beliefs that the Sphinx itself is too heavily damaged at this point to try and make any kind of accurate dating estimate based on weathering. As I mentioned before, they made the body out of poor quality limestone, which was already requiring repairs as early as the 18th dynasty, which is around 1400 BCE. Combine that with the enhanced weathering caused by pollution, and it's insane to try and date it that way. The closest anyone comes to agreeing with Shock is Colin Reeder, who agrees with the principle of water erosion, but disagrees with Shock on the timeline. Reeder places the earliest possible date to the early dynastic period, not even close to 12,000 years ago, like Shock believes. One thing that people don't tend to address is the seismic subsurface data that Schock and his colleague originally took. Schock insists that half of the Sphinx enclosure's floor is more weathered than the rest, indicating that the Sphinx was carved in two significantly different dates. He argues that this is evidence that Khafre restored part of the Sphinx, 
carving the rump portion during his reign. The only time it's ever been addressed was by Reader, who argued that it was inconclusive and needed more data, including actual ground samples. If you're wondering how archaeologists have dated the Sphinx, uh, they've used several different strategies. I'll tell you what I consider to be the most convincing. Uh, they've used a strategy uh, to determine the order of Khafre's Temple, the Sphinx, and Sphinx Temple, the order they were built, by using the unique geology of the area to their advantage. I'll provide links below, but the too long didn't read, is they found blocks from the upper strata from the Sphinx quarry inside of the Khafre Valley Temple adjacent to the Sphinx, implying that they were being built around the same time. And then there were blocks from the lower strata of the Sphinx quarry inside of the Sphinx temple, implying the Sphinx temple was built as the Sphinx was being wrapped up. If everyone can agree that Khafre's valley temple was built during Khafre's reign, and the Sphinx temple was built when the Sphinx was built, then this is a good indicator that Khafre's temple, the Sphinx, and the Sphinx temple were all built right around the same time. So, we're going to rate the myth that the Sphinx is 12,000 years old as false. One other honorable mention with the whole Sphinx is 12,000 years old argument goes to Graham Hancock, a pseudo-scientific journalist, and his argument is that the Sphinx would have been facing the constellation Leo around 10,500 BCE and that if the 4th dynasty pharaohs had built it, then it should have been a bull, because it was facing Taurus during the equinox. Beyond the obvious burden of proof he's lacking of who was there to build it, he's ignoring the fact that it made perfect sense for Khafre to build a sphinx, a lion with his face on it, during the 4th dynasty. This is because the lion was an animal closely associated with the sun in ancient Egypt, as well as the pharaoh, cats in general were. Khafre's brother and the previous pharaoh, Jedefra, had just introduced the title to the pharaoh, the son of Ra, Ra being the sun god. And of course, when you look at the Sphinx complex as a whole, on the March and September equinoxes each year, the sun sets along the south side of the Khafre Pyramid on a line extending along the right side of the Sphinx and aligned with the east-west axis of the Sphinx Temple. Unfortunately, it appears that Khafre died before the completion of the Sphinx Temple and construction was abandoned, and the realization of this Sphinx cult uh, was never completed. It wasn't for another 12,000, not 12,000, 1,200 years when the Sphinx became a kind of national park when kings began making pilgrimages to the site. So as we can see, uh, it makes sense that this would have been associated with the sun and therefore a lion uh, during the 4th dynasty, not a bull as Hancock hypothesizes. So anyway, like I said, Hancock can hypothesize that a fictional civilization built the Sphinx 12,000 years ago based on a constellation, but it's much more likely that the Sphinx was built by a civilization that we actually know about in honor of a god we know they actually worshipped. So we're going to rank this claim as no evidence. So that's it. That's the top five myths about the Great Sphinx and Giza that the internet won't let die. If you have more, let me know in the comments. Thanks.